Welcome to our webinar, Creating Accessible Online Resources for People with Disabilities. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am Alicia Kidd, the Online Learning Specialist for TechSoup. Now let's make sure everyone is comfortable using our webinar platform. Now you will see here on the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, anytime you um, have any problems with viewing or hearing the presenters or myself, please chat to us and we will um, send you guys instructions on how you can call into um, the webinar. And again, if you're hearing an echo through your computer speakers or having any issues with audio, you can dial in using the toll-free line and list in your registration email. Susan Hope Barr, who is assisting us with the chat, she will be presenting that throughout the chat throughout the entire um, live webinar. Also, the chat box is also for your questions. We will be flagging your questions and queuing your questions for later review during our Q&A session towards the end of the live webinar. If you lose your Internet connection, you can reconnect using the link in your registration or reminder email. We will also tweet out – not tweet out, I apologize – we will be chatting out the registration link. We are also recording this event, and all of your lines are muted so we can get a clear, crisp recording. You will be able to find this recording at our TechSoup webinar page later on today. This is where we share webinar recordings and announce upcoming webinars. We encourage you to check it out. Check out our upcoming webinars in this recorded webinar at our website at www.techsoup.org forward slash community forward slash events hyphenated webinars. You will receive a follow-up email as well with a link to the recorded presentation with any resources such as PowerPoint slides and links, as well as any um, FAQs from today's questions. Now if you are our Twitter follower, we highly encourage you to tweet us at TechSoup or use the hashtag PoundTSWebinar. And TechSoup is proud to introduce our presenters, Sharon Rush and Jane Cravens from Nobility. And again, my name is Alicia Kidd. I'm the Online Learning Specialist. And here to assist us with the chat is Susan Hope Bart, the Online Learning Education Manager. Now here's a few highlights about TechSoup. TechSoup is located here. Our headquarters is in San Francisco, California. So what I want to know from our audience is where are all of you all from? So please take a few seconds to chat where you guys are all from. Arizona, Cleveland, Oregon, great. San Francisco, local, Maryland, Washington, Louisiana, Iowa, great. So we have everyone from all over the United States. Hopefully we have some people. Oh, Argentina, we have inter an international audience as well. Now, a little bit more details about TechSoup. We have helped org organizations get billions of dollars in technology projects and grants to NGOs all around the world. These tech products and grants come from more than one of, more than one of 100 corporate and foundation partners. So now let's get started with our amazing um, presentation. And now I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Well, hello. Uh, I'm Jane Cravens. I'm uh, one of your presenters today. I'm in Oregon. I've worked with Nobility for a million years. Um, <laughs> and with me is Sharon Rush, who is an accessible. She's the founder of Nobility. Sharon, you want to introduce yourself? Um, no, you keep going. I just said howdy. Okay, she's the founder of Nobility and one of my very best friends, and we love talking about accessibility. Uh, so first, we'd like to do a little polling and find out who you are. We'd like to know what your role is in ensuring an accessible website at your organization. So um, are you the person that updates the content on the site? Are you the webmaster, the producer, the designer? Are you an accessibility pro? If so, why aren't you presenting with us? Um, do, you do, you, do you advise others on the site? Decision maker, perhaps your legal counsel, and you're hoping to comply with, with U.S. law. 
you have no web role. You're just here to learn more. And, or perhaps you have another reason for being here, and we hope you'll comment in the chat. So we're going to give it just a few more seconds for you to respond. Please pick one of these options. I would love to get to 100 people. We're at 85. And I'm going to close the results in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, we're going to skip to the results. And uh, interesting, so most of you are updating content on the site. Quite a few webmasters out there, welcome. Um, and we have some decision makers. We love that. And we have someone who has another reason, or a few people. Folks who have other reasons looking forward to, to finding out what those are. So I'm going to close the poll. Oh, and somebody we're said, somebody said that's okay. I like that check boxes. So the options would not be mutually exclusive. So maybe we'll uh, maybe we'll do that next time. Um, but now we just have these one choices, so you have to pick the one that most applies to you. Um, so for speaking from your own experience and your own website, what do you think is the biggest barrier to equal access that you have to address? So is the biggest problem, the biggest barrier um, actually meeting the technical requirements, getting your developers to understand the issues, uh, the fact that you feel like maybe you're, it would be necessary for you to build a whole new website? Do you need to get buy-in from your leadership board? Is it a funding problem? Do you need money to implement, improve, and rebuild? Um, do you have legacy software that limits your ability to offer accessible alternatives? <laughs> For a lot of people, this one's probably going to be, uh, I don't even know where to begin, and we're hoping to address that today. All of the above, so you can choose all of them. Or you can say there's another reason, and again, put your comment in the chat box. So choosing the most the most important one of those. We're going to close the polling in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. See the results. Ah, funding. Looks like funding is the biggest, the biggest barrier. Well, hopefully some of the things we're going to look at today are Get to show you some economical ways to address that. We have one more so let's poll do question. one more poll question. Ready? And it's a and it's a yes or no. Are you aware, or do you understand your legal responsibility around accessibility? I know some of you are in uh, countries other than the U.S. Uh, so I have to be honest, I'm not sure what those legal responsibilities are outside the U.S., um, but by all means, please answer. And you are all going very quickly. Yay. Uh, once again, trying very much to get to 100, but I need to close the poll. So 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay. That's pretty so, good though. You know, I think that's, that's better than when we talked about this ever. last year. I think we've got more, ever. more people who feel like they are aware of their legal responsibility, which is awesome. So there we go. I think it's uh I think we're ready to go with this presentation. Uh, so today we're talking about creating accessible online resources for people with disabilities and, and that means everyone. That means all people. We want to welcome everyone. Our goals today, we're going to talk about accessibility and why it matters, uh, not just what it is and how to do it. We're going to review some basics, uh, even if you're not a web designer, and I am not a web designer, just so you know. Um, we're going to cover some basics uh, that you can understand and help promote accessibility in your organization. And we're going to talk about an amazing event, Open Air, which will be an opportunity for nonprofits, NGOs, and others in the U.S. and abroad to achieve web accessibility. And of course we are going to answer your questions. And uh, just again, I'm Jane Cravens, 
And uh, I've worked with nobility for a million years. Just really want to emphasize that. And I've worked with TechSoup. This is probably my tenth webinar for them on a various topic. And I'm author of the last virtual volunteering guidebook. And my my partner in crime is Sharon Rush. Sharon Rush. And uh, just so you guys get to know my voice and distinguish between when I'm talking and when Jane's talking, I'll tell you. Once again, I'm the co-founder, executive director of uh, Nobility. And since 2006, I have been an invited expert for the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. We're going to be showing you some resources from that. And I currently serve as co-chair of the Education and Outreach Working Group. So um, a lot of the resources that we are going to point you to that are free and easy to use and um, we really encourage you to share them come from that resource. Back to you, Jane. And buy her book. Okay, so what, what are we saying when we say accessible? And it's, it's actually very simple. We, mean, we start with people. People with disabilities can acquire the same information, participate in the same activities, and actively produce as well as consume online content. So and I think the simple. reason that we like to the reason we like to emphasize this part about people is that as we saw in the poll a lot of people I think after funding the one was oh meeting the technical requirements are are you know going to be the most difficult thing but it's always good to remember that what we're really talking about here is making sure that people with disabilities are able to um use the site, get information from the site, and contribute in the same way as people without disabilities. Oops, sorry about that. So next we're going to talk about universal design, if I can get back to that slide. And universal design is a design that supports all people, uh, supports all technology, improves experience for everyone. Uh, to quote Dr. John Slayton, who was a wonderful uh, nobility supporter and contributor, good design is accessible design. So just to emphasize, we're, we're talking about good design, not just design for one group, but, but something that's universal for everyone. And I mentioned the W3C. They're really the group that decides what accessibility, how accessibility is defined. And they make the standards. The, the W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium, and they make all the standards for all web technologies. They tell you what's valid, JavaScript, HTML, all the different codes that are used, all the different languages that are used on the web and in other technologies. Um, so they are the standards makers, and they have an initiative called the Web Accessibility Initiative. So you've got the way at W3C, if you don't have enough alphabets in your soup, there's the more. Um, and they really try to support people who are new to accessibility and make them good. Because what you don't want to do is just open up this page of technical specifications and try to meet them. So there are a lot of uh, resources, sort of the on-ramp, how to get started. And uh, this is a link to some of those for designers, for writers, for developers. Oops, Jane, again. we're both doing it at the same time. Oh, I sorry. Let, okay. No, I should let you do the controls. We have a lot of reasons why we advocate for accessibility. There are the legal reasons which tend to be a real motivator for um, – that tends to be a really strong motivator for management and leadership. You know, they want to stay out of any legal risk. So that's, it's good to know that stuff. Uh, there are some market reasons that we're going to look at. The technical reasons are pretty clear. Because um, when, when you think about accessibility across all these different devices and platforms and mobile and tablets and different browsers, you find that you sell, solve technical problems that you, have any, that you may not have even anticipated, which is why you know, we say accessible, yes, for people with disabilities, but easier to use for everyone. And then I'm going to let Jane talk about the humanitarian and human rights reasons because it makes her heart beat faster. <laughs> okay, so next slide. I'll oh, click I it. I thought you were going to talk about the humanitarian reasons. 
So let's talk about why implement accessibility. Why do it? Um, and this is pretty text heavy, but I want to pound home the fact that people with disabilities, they want to donate, they want to volunteer, they want to otherwise support causes they care about. Uh, they support animal shelters. They support arts organizations. They love environmental organizations because they're people, and people do that. But if your website isn't accessible to them, they can't be your donors. They can't be your volunteers. They can't be your clients. And you lose out on their ideas and their talent and their contributions and so much more. So when we talk about accessibility, once again, we want to say, we're making a website useful for everyone. And I challenge you with this question. Would you rent a space, a, a meeting space, in an organization that prohibited certain people from entering? Of course not. So that's what we're talking about. We are, we are advocating for you to view online accessibility the same way. Uh, disability is a market force. And what we mean by that is nearly 20% of the U.S. population has a disability. And that probably translates to all the people you're targeting as volunteers, clients, donors. Um, and the number is growing as the population ages. So you have a large representation of people with disabilities among your constituents, even if you don't think you do. You do. And you want to include them. You want to welcome them to your website. So that's another reason to uh, advocate for accessibility. Uh, this is a growing constituency. Fortune Magazine calls it a $1 trillion annual market. Uh, those are some pretty powerful statistics there. And again, it just goes more and more as the population ages. Now Sharon is going to talk a little bit about the law. Yeah, see, Jane talks about the fun people part, and I get to talk about the law. But the fact <laughs> is the law is really a very powerful incentive for a lot of organizations because of, you know, they're afraid of legal risk. And, and now um, uh, during the last administration, the Department of Justice was very active in enforcing, as a civil right, enforcing accessibility um, laws on the web. And in fact, they even have... Um, they even passed a new 21st century accessible technology law that said if you put video on the website as an outreach uh, message, you have to have captioning and in some cases um, audio description. So even though a lot of um, uh, there, there's a perception that oh, Section 508 that's just for federal government agencies, which is true. But the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, has increasingly been interpreted by the courts to apply to the web because the courts say, well, look, when they passed the ADA, they didn't even know how the Internet was going to be used, but the intent clearly for public space includes the Internet, which is our most public space these days. So U.S. federal law is, uh, is used more and more, and some of you may have heard recently about Winn-Dixie stores grocery store chain, mostly in the South, and they recently fought against a, uh, you know, they said, well, you can buy all the same stuff in, the, in our physical stores. It doesn't matter that our website is not accessible. But the judge disagreed, had a big fine, and now those stores are under uh, federal watch as they redevelop to make sure they meet accessibility needs. So the law really is a powerful, uh, powerful tool. And as it turns out, you know, Jane said earlier, I don't know what the laws are in other countries, but over 100 nations have now signed the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And that convention is explicit that equal access to technology is a human right and, is, uh, and it's been codified by law in many, many countries, including Japan and many Asian companies, Australia, and um, and of course, the European Union is a very strong supporter of this convention and has passed very specific laws about digital accessibility. Yay! So, yay! So though, there are legal <laughs> reasons, there are market reasons, there are technical reasons. But I think as we advocate, as we as advocates, and, and we really want to make our case, we always come back to the fact that it's about people 
And these are some of the people in our community. Um, Stevie Wonder is a close personal friend. Ha <laughs> ha, I wish. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, remembering that it's about people and that you don't want to lock people out is, is really important. The next slide is about, is a, um, let me see, where are those controls? There they are. Um, again, the, the Web Accessibility Initiative at the W3C, if you need some persuasive tools, if you are the advocate in your organization and you're trying to persuade them that, you know, we really need to make this part of our process and think about accessibility of our digital materials, these videos, there are 10 of them, all of them are less than two minutes long, and they are just really wonderful, persuasive, because a lot of people have no experience of someone with a disability trying to use technology and having that frustration. So these videos are good for that, and I think, Jane, you wanted to say something about that. Uh, I, we have had events on site in Austin where web designers have seen people with disabilities use assistive technologies, and it's the moment they get it you can see their eyes widen and they finally get it that this beautiful web design that they've you know, created maybe isn't that beautiful for everyone. So I really encourage you to use these videos to help, to help have some aha moments in your own organizations. The basic principles of accessible content are pretty, pretty clear. They're saying regardless of your ability to see or hear or move your arm or whatever your, um, your physical capabilities, accessible content will be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust across an entire spectrum of assistive technologies, platforms, um, browsers, browser combinations, and so those principles are what guide the development of all the other specifications that, where, um, that, that developers and designers can use to, to guide them to actually achieve that. So we're going to talk about some common barriers and easy fixes. And I call these the fixes that even I can understand as a, as a non-web developer. Uh, we're going to go through each of these, uh, link text, text alternatives, PDF, color and contrast in media. We're going to touch on these and give you resources to get more in-depth into them. Uh, so one of, my, uh, one of my favorite accessibility things, and if, if you walk away with nothing else, I hope you walk away with this, is you need to get rid of click here and read more on your websites. Uh, links should be specific. Instead of read more, it should say list of our board of directors or um, find out more about our services. And the reason is that people with assistive technologies come to your website and just as I would perhaps just look for the links. I just want to see the links. I there's a specific information I'm looking for. Someone with assistive technology that's reading it as audio is going to say, oh, I just want to hear the links because I'm looking for something specific. And if you only have click here, then the links are going to say click here, click here, click here, click here. It's not going to tell them anything, you know, directions to your organization or where you are or list of board of directors. So please make sure your links um, have descriptive text, aren't just more or click here. And one of the things I learned in putting together this presentation was ARIA described uh, link descriptions. This was new for me, and this is one of those cases where the W3C uh, explained to me what this is. Um, and this is a description in the code that informs the user uh, what a button does when it's activated. Does it close a box? Does it close a window? A sighted user, such as myself, I'm not going to see it. But a screen, reader will, a screen reader user is going to hear it. And so I actually grabbed a little graphic off the W3C to show exactly what that looks like in the code. And it's, it's very simple. It just says, you know, description close. It, it closes the window and it discards the information and returns you back to the main page. Um, that's a really simple fix. And I could understand it even though I'm not a web designer. Uh, and there's also text-based alternatives, and uh, this is where this users. 
Yeah, Sharon will do this. Well, because this one is funny because you we we've got this little picture in the corner about the um, with the box of chocolate, and you'd think, okay, well that's a graphic of a box of chocolate. I can easily just put that in as the alt text. But the fact is that all all visual images have some kind of purpose. Why are they there? And um, in some cases, they really are just eye candy. And in that case, you can leave the alt attribute blank. You can just say alt equals quote, quote, and the screen reader has the permission to stay silent. Now, I should tell you that a screen reader is used by blind people to take the text information on a web page and read it out loud in a linear fashion. If it comes to a, an image that has no alternative text in the code, it will read the source code. And it's a pretty painful experience for someone to be reading along and suddenly hear source code. So you want to be sure that every image has alt text of some kind. If it's really just there for decoration, you can leave an empty alt, as I said. If it has um, a meaning in the, so maybe this was a product that I'm trying to sell, then the box of chocolate would be very clearly described so that the user would be able to understand you know, the, what their choices are. I actually found this image on a bank website where it was a link, and the message was, we have several different mortgage op options. The choice is yours. So I don't, in that case, I don't even need to know that it's a box of chocolates. What I need to know is that it is a link to the mortgage option choices. So there is a, there is a very um, uh, clear decision process that you need to go through to decide what is proper alt text for your images. And this uh, link to the Way Tutorial Decision Tree is really, really helpful for you to make those kinds of choices. Another, I had to laugh at this when Jane put uh, PDF accessibility as one of the easy fixes because there are times where PDF accessibility is really, really hard. And that's if something has been scanned in and the entire thing is an image or if um, it's been created with no tagging at all and you have to go back and fix it. The thing that's really easy about making accessible PDFs is if your source document, whatever you're starting with, so if you're making a PDF from a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet or a PowerPoint, if you build those accessibility features into that source document, they're often brought over into the PDF and then it's a very painless process. So there's a free tutorial from the federal government about how to do that. And even if you inherit um, an inaccessible PDF, how you can fix it and, and really be sure that you're not leaving people out with those kinds of documents on your website. Color and contrast is one that I think people don't pay enough attention to. Um, the fact is some users have color blindness. There is also low vision. Uh, my mother has macular degeneration. She has a lot of trouble seeing um, things that are that don't have high contrast. And um, color blindness is more prevalent than many people know. I bet there are people on this call, several, who have uh, color blindness. One in eight men in the United States has color blindness. So you want to avoid using color as the only way to uh, give someone an instruction or provide meaning. So in the example on the screen here, we've got tell us who you are, required fields are in red. Well, if I have red-green color blindness, I'm probably not going to be able to know which one of those fields is red. So you want to add, and it's not that you can't use color as an indicator. You certainly can. But you just want to add something else. So if you had in red with an asterisk or in red with an underline, so there was something that supported the use of color and color was not the only way to do it. Um, contrast, again, can be an issue for many, many people. And um, there's an example of good and bad contrast on this, on this slide. 
the W3C standard recommends 4.5 to 1 or higher. Um, again, you just look at the palette of your, of, of your organization and try to find colors that, that meet that standard or meet or exceed that standard. Jane's going to talk about media. Before I turn it over to her, I just want to um, tell a story about last week we had the uh, LEAD conference here in Austin. It was, uh, it's hosted by the Kennedy Center from Washington, D.C., but they, every other year they go out into the field. And LEAD stands for Leadership Exchange in Arts and Disability. So it's performance organizations, museums, um, all kinds of, of uh, arts organizations, and the people who come to the LEAD conference are usually the ADA coordinators. They are not... Um, they are not the technical people, the web designers, the uh, CTOs, but usually the ADA coordinators. And we did a workshop on accessible media so that because so many of them post videos to their websites, and we shared a lot of um, free resources for captioning and ways to make their media accessible. And Jane has actually used some of these herself, so I'm going to turn it over to you, Jane, to continue. Yeah, the, there are so many great resources out there. Nobility has more information about how to make uh, your videos more accessible. It's important that uh, your video is provided on a keyboard operable media player so that someone doesn't have to have a mouse um, or doesn't have to just use their finger, that they can uh, use tabs or, or other items on their keyboard. And the audio content needs to be captioned and synchronized to on-screen actions. Uh, some of the videos on the on the Nobility website are great examples of this, and uh, there also needs to be description of key content in an audio description track uh, for someone who might have a sight impairment. And uh, again, this is this is a pretty easy fix to do. There are uh, there's a free tool on Google, for instance, but you will still need to go over. Uh, their conversion, their interpretation of the audio, because some of the things, some of the words they interpret come out very strangely. So you still need a human uh, to have a, a look at those. And so, okay, aside from the PDF, these are easy fixes for your website. These are things you can do right away. They're easy to learn. They're easy to do. Uh, none cost money. They cost time, um, but they don't really cost money. And uh, really there's something that you can just start doing with your new pages. Um, it's, it's about just setting it as a priority, and then it's not extra time. And remember that volunteers can help. This is a great task for volunteers. Volunteers love doing this. I know because I recruit volunteers to do these kind of things when I'm working on a website. And I usually have to close my recruitment early because I get so many people who, who want to do these things. Um, and you can learn more at this really great link uh, from the Web Accessibility um, Initiative, an easy checks, which can help you just do some really simple things on your website right now um, that can help you become more accessible to everyone. And the glory of, I think, that one of the really uh, strong values of that easy checks is that that's a way to kind of get, take the temperature of your website and, it, and that um, this process will lead you through it step by step. It will tell you what browser tools, what free browser tools you can install, things you can use to just do a quick check. Do I even have alt text on my site? How do I know that? Are my link text proper? How do I know that? Are my forms labeled? Those things that we've been talking about, you say, well, it's great that you tell me that I need to have this, but how do I even know? And this is a really good way to get a, just a basic sense. You're not going to find all the errors. You're not going to find everything. But the Easy Checks is just uh, meant to be for people who aren't particularly technical um, to be able to, to, again, take that temperature. I wanted to, um, if I can remember how to use this thing, I wanted to see how do I put something in here for everybody, broadcast to all. There's a hilarious video called on YouTube. It's called the Jamaican Vacation Caption Fail, and it's about these, um, these guys who use the automated uh, captioning tool on, on uh, YouTube. And then 
what the caption said they were saying. It's very, very funny. So I would recommend you do that just as a cautionary tale against using those W3 or using those YouTube tools. You have to often go back and clean up the captions just just so you know, just so you don't think it's all going to be completely painless. And there are more difficult online barriers. So um, some of these will require a more significant redesign effort. Um, the, you can really minimize the costs of that if you integrate accessibility planning in. So if you know you're going out for an RFP to get a new website, make sure that you include accessibility requirements in that work as it's defined and as it's, uh, as it's bid out so that you hire people who understand it. Um, uh, we're going to look real quickly at some of those problems with, uh, it could be the structure of your website, and that's, you know, this is, um, semantic structures are part of the HTML code for a reason, and that is to, um, it's what search engines rely on, it's what a lot of uh, the hierarchical structure relies on so that you can find things easily, and the assistive technologies understand HTML and can use that as well. So if your site is, is properly structured, it's already going to be much easier for an assistive technology to use and to interact with. And this is um, some of the ways that you, can, that you can do that. I would suggest you pass this along to the geeks in your, in your company. You also want to be sure that the reading and focus order match the same, uh, flow in the same way as what's displayed on the page. And that's really a matter of the code order and how, how those things are uh, created and presented. Again, um, you want to be able to navigate through the site using your keyboard commands and, not, um, and find the order in the same way that you would if you were reading it. And keyboard is another, um, is another one of those things that's a little bit, it's more difficult to implement than alt text probably, but it's really, really important because so many assistive technologies rely on keyboard control. You know, if I'm blind, I can't use a point and click device like a mouse. So if I use speech input, I may be able to rely on uh, uh, my, my voice input is going to be keyed to the keyboard commands. And so a lot of the different assistive technologies are going to map to the keyboard. So the, the illustration on this slide shows with a mouse, I get this yellow, the change in the color of the link, and a, a whole drop down happens here, a drop down menu. You want to be able to have that kind of action, whether you're using a mouse or a keyboard. So if I tab to that menu item, I want the same color change, I want the same drop down. And um, it's something, this is a very, very common error. So going forward, um, I know that we have not been able to provide nearly as much detail as you're all probably very hungry for because we only have an hour and we want time for questions. But what we're going to ask you to do, we, we're giving you an assignment. Um, after this presentation, we hope that if you're not already, we really want you to be an advocate for accessibility at your organization. Again, I just want to you know, emphasize, I am not a web designer. I, I really don't understand much. But I am an advocate for accessibility, and I know how to ask questions now of web designers uh, so that I can get an accessible website. Uh, we hope we've given you some tools and some resources and links to resources so that you can get buy-in from senior management. Please use this presentation. It's going to be available as you heard from TechSoup and also uh, from the uh, W3 initiative. That's a great way to advocate for accessibility within your organization. And we encourage you to, when you recruit web designers, whether they're paid, contract, employees, volunteers, we encourage you to put the line in the description that you need someone who, will, who understands accessible design or will who commit to learning it and applying accessibility. You, you have every right to, to have that um, requirement of the people that you recruit. Uh, that can be a great, great way to become an uh, advocate for 
accessibility. And we have an opportunity for those of you who are nonprofits, NGOs, um, charities, mission-based organizations, uh, we have an event called Open Air. And it's a contest for web designers. They all get together and they design websites for nonprofits, NGOs, schools, etc. And they design them to be accessible. They have only five weeks to do it. And it's a competition. There are judges. The teams are mentored. Uh, but what we need are we need nonprofits and NGOs and schools and government agencies who need a new website or don't have a website and want one uh, to be a part of this event. And the result is for your fee, you get the training and support uh, needed uh, to under understand accessibility even more, and you get a website, a beautiful website. Uh, around February 2018 is the end of the competition, and you walk away with, with a website. Uh, and your nonprofit will be promoted by Nobility for its participation. Uh, we, we really promote your name and who you are and what you do. The benefits are you're matched with a team of web professionals. And many of these are people that return again and again because they love the event so much. Uh, we provide support to help you prepare to be a great client to your web design team. We provide uh, training to you. The design team gets a great deal of training. They get a mentor. There's regular check-ins. And I am your check-in person. I am the person that will be talking to you, supporting you. You can call me, email me, text me. I'm going to be there for you. Uh, you control all your content. You control uh, the styles, the images, what it is you want. This is You are the client for these teams. And we provide maintenance and sustainability training uh, once your site launches. We're still there for you to help you with the site. Uh, and again, this is a six-week, I said five-week, sorry, competition. You need to register by November 30th. That seems a long way away, but we'd like for you to put it on your calendar and really think about it. The competition kicks off in January, but I'll be having uh, webinars next month, the month after. Really want to get a lot of you participating, and uh, so this could be something you could have other I staff would, members participate in. If I, Go, if I can interrupt, I would just say that please. the sooner you register, the sooner you register, the better, because we're, we are going to start the training and the support activities uh, right away. And the people who are most prepared get the best teams. <laughs> and, Absolutely um, true. And so the sooner that you register, the more likely you are to have, feel like you're really going to be a strong competitor. You're going to have your materials in place. We put a, a base camp at your disposal for, to communicate. We had a team a couple years ago with uh, developers that were all around the globe. They were in London, India, San Francisco, and New York, and they developed a, a, a what is it public television station in Nairobi. So um, it's it's really it's a blast. It's so much fun. It is it is a blast. It's it's my favorite my favorite favorite group volunteering event. And if you know me as a volunteering uh, researcher, you know that's a pretty high bar because I know a lot of events. Um, please look at the website. There's we've got FAQs. We've got lots more information, and uh, you know there's there's no commitment to just go to the website and have a look at the information and write me and ask more questions. So. With that, we'll say thank you, and we're ready for, to hear from you um, and go through some of your questions now with TechSoup. Thank you so much for this amazing information. I'm sure our audience really appreciated this in-depth um, live webinar with all these great resources. Now we're going to spend a few minutes just answering questions from our audience. And the first question that I have is, in regards to webinars and people um, that are disabled, um, the first question is, where could we find best practices for hosting live events online such as webinars? We want to be as welcoming as possible during these events, but not understanding that the cost is high, is fairly high for live captioning. So can you talk a little bit about webinar software or just accessibility for um, individuals that are disabled? 
think that's for Sharon. Sorry. I know. I'm sorry. I was on mute. I have I have a cough, so I had muted so that you guys didn't have to listen to me cough. You know, that's that's a, a really uh, that's probably one of the biggest challenges because we do that with the air event. We're global, and so all of our meetings and events and everything, we have to think about that. And I saw earlier in this presentation, people were asking about live captioning. And often it is outside the budget. It's um, the, the cost of that has really come down, and we work with a place here in Austin called Texas Captioners, and uh, I'm sorry for the um, commercial broadcast, but they, their costs have come down so much since we started with them, uh, using them for webinars a few years ago, um, that, it, that we just, now we just work it into our costs. You know, it's part of our budget. It's part of what we expect to be able to provide captions. And you'd be surprised at how many people really benefit from captions regardless of whether they can hear or not. You know, people who um, maybe have English as a second language or, you know, may, maybe there is an accent in the voice of the speaker. And um, so captions are really a useful thing. As well, captions <coughs> contribute to your, um, you know, to your search engine results. So they're definitely worth the investment, in my opinion. Um, the other thing to be aware of is if you know who's in your audience. So always when you have a registration process, ask people. Because if you don't have anyone who needs it in the live broadcast, you can always go back and caption it before you post it, which is much more economical. As well, if you know that you have blind people in your audience who are dialing into the webinar, you can be sure that you explain whatever images are on your screen so that you're not and, – and that's probably a good practice anyway to be able to say, and there's an image of whatever it is that you're showing, or this is a graph that indicates this much revenue for this or that. You know, those, those kinds of things are probably good practice no matter where you present and whether it's online or in person. There is, again, I'm going back to the W3C, there is a, um, a section, I'll try to find the URL so I can put it in the chat, of what to consider when you're doing presentations for accessibility. And I think it's appropriate for both live and uh, or in-person or posted webinar content. It was a long answer. I hope it was helpful in some way. No, it was very helpful. Thank you so much. We have another, it's more of a, I guess, a comment along with your feedback. One person states, knowing many folks, they prefer to be described as having additional needs, not labeled disabled. Disabled has a connotation that they are less able or less educated or less intelligent. What is your feedback? That was just a comment made. By one of our oh, I, no, I, I understand there is some sensitivity around it. Um, uh, I have a very, uh, you know, we have a very large um, community of people with disabilities, and we continue to use the word because it is easily recognized, and sometimes the language it's easily translated. Uh, we work internationally. Um, I think you have to be sensitive to individual people's needs. And um, if you know that you're that you are um, in a public forum, I think you, that's a good thing to be aware of and to watch how the sensitivities might be changing over time. And I think uh, the the person who asked that question is is right to raise it as a question. Right now, I think um, there's not really an agreed upon. You know, when you say differently abled, people think that's maybe a little torturous language. Um, if you say, you know, if you push the language too far, it, it can seem affected and strange and not very natural. So um, I, I'm all with you in finding new vocabulary, but I'm not sure we've agreed on what that is yet. Jane, did you want to add to that? No, I, it, it, the same thing, and I, I do this with a lot of groups. I've, I've, I've worked with groups that prefer one, um, way of description and then when I've used that description with 
what I've interpreted as the same group, they've gone, no, 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 that's not the term to use. I always ask, you know, I usually ask. I will say that, you know, yeah, my language has evolved tremendously from when I started working with nobility back in the 90s uh, to now, to, to the way I talk and the, and the way the community talks about itself. So yeah, let's just keep learning. Let's keep asking people how they would like to be described, and uh, let's just keep remembering we're talking about people. Great. Thank you for that amazing answer. Another question that I have is in regards to images and infographics. One person um, stated, can you, lay, can you speak to complex images like charts and infographics? Um, yeah, well there are, um, you know, there are many, the ARIA described by, ARIA has a lot of um, features for, for complex images and complex interactions. And I would recommend that you explore those because um, those can be very, very helpful in, um, in getting to exactly what you need. Complex images, charts, graphs, um, math ML is coming a long way so that maybe um, it, it, it has a lot of promise. Often I think a synopsis of what's happening on the graph, even on you know, visible for sighted users as well, can be really helpful. For for in my case, I can I have visual capability, but I am not very good at interpreting visual information. Uh, icons often confuse me. Um, charts and graphs often confuse me. So to see something that's just a synopsis of the trend over the last one or two 50 more. years has been this is uh, I so think 12? is a useful. Hello. Is, yes, I'm here. Useful, Sorry about that. Okay, that's all right. Um, it is a useful thing to, to think about. Um, I, I'm going to make a note to add, maybe Alicia, I can send you, um, I've got a note about the captioning resource, the live presentations, and I'm going to send a little, uh, another link that you can add about uh, ways to approach. Um, you know, the, the W3C, again, I mean, I, I think I, I'm wearing my Education and Outreach Working Group chair hat today a lot, but these resources, we've been working on them for a decade or more of things to help people do that. There's, um, there's a, a tutorial on alt text, and they have a, an entire section on how to approach this question of graphs and charts. So I'll add that link to the um, to the links that you're going to get when the when the presentation closes. Great. And another question we have is are there any newer model newer models of laptops for a blind person that you can name? Um, well, you know, Apple, I'm sorry, Apple just does such great work in that field. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the Macs have voiceover, the voiceover commands are spectacular. Um, the you know the, the it was it was Apple's pioneering work to meet the needs of the blind community that led to Siri, which of course you don't have to be blind to appreciate Siri, and so their interaction with voice commands uh, and uh, on the Mac products I think are just fantastic, phenomenal. So um, I. Sorry to be a commercial. I don't know if I've violated a TechSoup, <laughs> but that's really the truth. The, the Apple products are are far and away. They've got a head start over everybody. And you know, Google and the Chrome folks, they're they're catching up. But um, but I think that Apple products by far are the are the best for blind users. Another person mentioned it's like a common question. They stated it would be neat to have a list of screen reader tools. Or a set of tools to test on pages, or source, or for some sort of site exercise app, which could suggest where certain descriptions could be added. Um, yeah, that's a that is that's a great idea. I think um, there are um, well, there are tools and apps of all kinds now, and they're getting to be. There's there's one app. That's called um, I think it's called Be My Eyes, 
And it's a thing where volunteers will say, I'm going to spend this much time online, and, and the blind person can call in or, or somehow connect. And like if you're in another city and you can hold up your phone and they look and say, oh, you're at the corner of Fifth and Vine, you know, because you've got a sighted person on the other side and you hold up your phone. And um, as far as screen readers, there is a free screen reader um, that you can download and learn more about how the commands work. It's called NVDA. I think it has it stands for something non-visual something. NVDA, and um, you can download that and use a free screen reader. It's it's not quite as robust as some of the ones you have to pay for, but it sure does help you to figure out. Oh, this is what it means if I'm blind and trying to use the web. This is what it's like to have to listen to the web rather than see it. Great. Thank you so much. Another question is, how do you tell that you're using a 4.5 to 1 contrast? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, there is another, another free tool called uh, the Color Contrast Analyzer. And it looks like a little palette, like a little paint palette. And you pull out an eyedropper and you grab a pixel of this color that your text is and a pixel of the one behind, and it will measure and report to you what the, what the contrast is. It's called the Color Contrast Analyzer. If you put it in a search, you'll find it, and uh, it's a free download. Okay. And that, that uh, easy checks that I told you about, the easy check mm -hmm. kind of tells you about a bunch of these different free browser tools that you can use to test a lot of this stuff. Okay, great. I think we're done with the questions. So I do want to thank everyone um, for those engaging questions. And before we go, um, I just want to engage our audience. Chat out one thing that you learned or that you wish to share with a coworker or a teammate regarding this amazing presentation. So take a few moments to chat out one thing you've learned or you wish to share with a coworker or a teammate about this presentation. And while you're doing that, I just want to let you know that you, we also want to know what we want you to chat out is will you share this information with your colleagues and anyone within your network. So chat that out if you would if you would share this amazing webinar because this is great information especially with technology and working with people with disabilities. They are a growing population. So please um, check that out. And also in conclusion, please complete after this webinar is over, there is going to be a post-event survey that will pop up. And we highly encourage everyone to answer that survey. It just gives us feedback to our presenters, to TechSoup, to make this webinar um, more beneficial the next time, as well as to get your feedback as to see if this information was beneficial. It was beneficial for me, and I know it was beneficial for you as well. Also, we have, um, if you're part of the TechSoup family or new to the TechSoup family, we do have courses that we offer, and you can find those courses at our website at TechSoup.org textbook.course.tc forward slash catalog. You can create a free account and join and see a whole bunch of great videos around technology and helping improve your organization. And as well, on our textbook.org website under webinars and events, these are our next upcoming webinars for the month of September. And we have a very active month. We're going to we're starting our Storymakers campaign as well as our grant. So on 914, we have our first Storymakers campaign with Greenpeace, a 10-step process. On 920, getting started with making your grant request sparkle with GrantStation. 921, building a grant strategy. On September 26, get to know your GrantStation tour. And Bold is Gold Conducting Funding Research, which will be on 927. And so remember to join. Those are all free to everyone that's within the TechSoup family or not in the TechSoup family. So go to our website, and that will be in the chat. And you can sign up, and we hope, hopefully you will enjoy 
those upcoming webinars. And I want to take time to thank our two amazing presenters from Nobility. Thank you so much. And also we would like to thank everyone that participated with this webinar, and hopefully you learned some new information. This webinar will be available by the end of the day. If you've registered, it will also be uploaded to our YouTube and our um, website later on today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to fill out the survey. Also, there will be a post survey as well, as I mentioned before. Take time to fill out that survey. Your, your feedback is greatly appreciated. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your week. And thank you to thank our you. sponsor, ReadyTalk.